that's in chapter six of the polynomial system solving book. I have been debating actually until this morning what the second hour would be, uh, but there were some emails floating around with uh, applications to economics, so I decided to talk about this one, so Nash equilibrium. I mean, on the, on the offset, why are we all here? Well, we're here because we are so excited about next year's SIEM Algebraic Geometry Conference, right? In 2015, in August, we are going to be very excited having the SIEM Algebraic Geometry Meeting in Dijon. There will be lots of fantastic special sessions. I'm hoping that there will be at least one special session on economics. And so I'm going to tell you about this very old-fashioned connection between algebraic geometry and economics. And in the meantime, there are, of course, much more recent ones, but this is sort of an old hat. So I'm going to tell you the old hat, and that's Nash equilibrium. Let me tell you what an n-person game is in normal form, and we're going to explain that for a three-person game. We have three players, Adam, Bob, and Carl. And each of them have their choices, okay? So Adam wants to involve in the stock, wants to invest in the stock market, okay? So which stocks, you know, should he buy? Google, Dropbox, United Airlines, he wants to allocate some money and buy stocks. And he maybe has a, a bunch of choices, one, two, up to alpha. A finite list of choices of possible stocks or investments he can buy. Okay? Now Bob also has choices. One, two, up to beta. And he has some job offers. Right? So Bob has job offers. He has a job offer from Samsung and from Sony and, I don't know, Microsoft. And he has to make up his mind. Which job should he choose? Okay? Carl has choices, one up to Gamma, and he has to choose a girlfriend, right? Susie, Cindy, I mean, whatever, right? So he has to choose a, a partner, right? So, so, so those are the choices that they have, okay? Now, these choices are correlated. There's going to be some independent structure, right? So Bob's choice of a job somehow has a correlation structure with Carl's choice of a girlfriend, right? So. So to make this all precise, we're going to have a payoff tables. So there's a payoff table A for Adam, and that's a, a three-dimensional tensor A, I, J, K for Adam. Bob has a tensor B, I, J, K, and C, C, I, J, K. So these are tensors and economics, they're called payoff tables. And these are alpha by beta by gamma tensors. So each of them has a three-dimensional tensor of format alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, what's the interpretation of these? Well, these are the payoffs. Okay, so alpha, I, J, K is the amount of money, you know, that's the gain that Adam gets if he chooses I, Bob chooses J and Carl chooses K. Right? So if it's a payout, let's measure it in one. Right? So, so, you know, C, I, J, K is the payout that Carl gets if Adam chooses I, Bob chooses J, and he chooses K. Okay? This could be positive or negative, right? So there could be a positive payout or negative, you know, that means he has a penalty. Okay? Okay, now what are they going to do? So each player they do not se 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 select a pure strategy. So picking a, a, a pure strategy means Carl chooses Susie. Period. That would be a pure strategy. But in this game we don't choose pure strategies. We're going to choose mixed strategies. So each player just like in real life selects a probability distribution. on their own choices, okay? So this probability distribution is a mixed strategy, okay? So Adam chooses a probability distribution, so that's a point 
in the standard simplex of dimension alpha 1, alpha minus 1, and then there's a probability distribution for Bob, and then there's a probability distribution for Carl, and they simply pick a probability distribution on their choices. So that's a non-negative real vector whose coordinates sum to 1. Right? So what's the meaning? Well, for example, Adam, he doesn't want to put all of egg, his eggs in one basket. Right? So he, rather than investing all his money, you know, he has a million one, rather than investing this in one company, he allocates it to different stocks according to his probability distribution. And, and you can make your own story about Carl and Bob, right? So everybody has a probability distribution, and that's their choice of a mixed strategy. Now when these guys are done making their choices, they calculate their payoff, right? So Adam's payoff, what's Adam's payoff? Well, if everybody chose a pure strategy, then the payoff would be just an entry in this table. Right? If everybody chose deterministically, then Adam's payoff is just an entry. But since we're choosing a, uh, a probability distribution, a mixed strategy, we think about these tensors as trilinear forms, and we're just evaluating the trilinear form. Right? So we take i from 1 up to alpha, jump j from 1 up to beta, and then kij up to gamma, so i, j, k are the entry, the coefficients of the trilinear form, and then we go a, i times b, j times c, k. Okay. So this trilinear expression, that's Adam's payoff. So after, after everybody chosen you know, their mixed strategy, we calculate Adam's payoff. Right. And this trilinearity makes sense. Right? So if everybody has a, a deterministic distribution, we get an entry. But then, you know, if Adam invests 50% into this stock and 50% into the other stock, well, then it's half-half. Right. That's the payoff. That's how the game works. And similarly for Bob and Carl. Bob and Carl. Okay. So that's a game in normal form, and so here is the, uh, the key definition. So collectively, they chose a point, ABC, inside some big polytope, namely the direct product of the simplices. So there's a Adam's simplex times Bob's simplex times Carl's simplex, so all together that gives a big polytope that are called delta. So collectively, they're choosing a point in this closed compact polytope delta, some high dimensional Toblerone, direct product of simplices. And we're going to say this point is a Nash equilibrium. That's our key definition. It's a Nash equilibrium. If no player, can unilaterally, by himself, all by himself, unilaterally increase his payoff. And it's a, a Nash equilibrium. Okay. So it's sort of a very intuitive definition, right? So they make their choices, A, B, C, then they calculate their payoff. Okay. Now everybody sees the other people's choices and, you know, Adam says, wait a minute, you know, now that I see what Bob and Carl have chosen, maybe I can do better, right? Maybe I can change my choice, they keep their choices, and I can increase, I get a more payoff, right? If that's possible, then we're not in Nash equilibrium. But if nobody by himself can increase their payoff by just changing their choice, then it's a Nash equilibrium. Okay, that's a key definition. Now I'll tell you, you know, stories about Russell Crowe and Jennifer, whatever, some other time over beer, you know. But so I got into this around the time of the, the movie, The Beautiful Mind, on which Dave Beyer was the math consultant. So 
Dave Beyer. In the state of New York, there's unique car whose license plate is Syzygies. It's a vanity plate in the state of New York and a Syzygy. So that's Dave. And he was also the hand double for Russell Crowe. So there are many stories about Dave. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that's how I learned about Nash Equilibria. I thought we're getting into this and we had a thesis. So I'll tell you about Uchira Dada's work. But what I found interesting, so I went around Berkeley campus, you know, starting to talk to people. And I can assure you at UC Berkeley on campus, 10 years ago, there were more scholars who, know, who knew what a Nash equilibrium is than there are scholars who know what a polynomial is. Try that at KAIST or Seoul National University. I claim there are more people who know what a Nash equilibrium is than there are people who know what a polynomial is. It's an experiment worth trying. Okay, and a party. Try this at a party. Okay, so. Okay, now let's turn this into math. Okay, so for example, right? So let's turn this English sentence into math. So, so the fact that Adam can't do better, we can write as follows. So for every other u that he could have chosen, right, in his simplex, the value of his trilinear form, a i j k, a i b j c k, is greater or equal to the sum a i j k u i b j c k. Right? So if he's trying to replace his a by some other u, he's going to get worse. He's either going to stay the same or he's going to get worse. Okay? That's and then the same for Bob and Carl. So this is the formula. It's a quantified formula that characterizes Nash equilibrium, right? For all u for Adam, this is the case, and for all u for Bob, and for all u for Carl, okay? Now, let me rewrite this a little bit. So please interrupt me. Is this clear so far? Okay, so, so now I claim, let's look at this function, okay? So capital A, that's fixed. But now B and C is also fixed, right? Just, just, we're just looking at Adam. Adam is playing around. He's trying to improve his payoff. So just from Adam's point of view, this is a linear function, right? This is all, this is a constant. And this is a, a linear function in U, right? All we're saying is, you know, that for every U in the simplex, the value of this linear function is at most this number, right? But you know, if you have a linear function, a simplex, you know, bounded above, it's enough to look at the vertices, right? So if, if the linear function is bounded above at the vertices, it's a linear function. It's bounded above, you know, by convexity at, at everywhere else. So this is equivalent to, for all u in the vertices, e1, e2, up to e alpha, okay? These are the unit vectors in of length alpha, it is the case, blah, 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 okay? That's good. So I've taken this univer universal quantification and I've replaced it by a finite conjunction, right? So I can plug in u equals e1 and u equals e2 and u equals e3 and I have no longer a quantifier, okay? Okay, let's do one more thing. I'm going to rewrite this two more times. And this is, this is the tricky part, okay? Now comes the tricky part, so let's do it here. So I'm going to rewrite this condition two more times, and then it becomes friendly for us. <coughs> okay, so let me argue that that's equivalent to the following. So let's introduce a new unknown capital U, okay? So capital U is simply, you know, a, a new unknown. I'm going to write it like this. A1 times the sum over all J and K, A, I, J, K, B, J, C, K. Bear with me for a moment. A2 sum over all J and K, a, I, J, K, 
BJCK plus plus A alpha JK plus A, uh, A alpha sum over all JK um, A alpha and here we need a two, sorry, so this is a two and this is a one. We're getting there. JK, BJ, CK. And I claim that that's greater or equal to this parenthesis and greater or equal to that parenthesis and greater or equal to that parenthesis. Okay, so what have I done? I haven't done anything, right? All I did is I took this left-hand side and I broke it, you know, according to i. So I wrote down the sum for i equals 1 plus for i equals 2 plus 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 for i equals alpha. That's the long line. And then, you know, this is supposed to be bigger than this one for i equals 1. That's just saying that this whole thing is bigger than this parenthesis. But it's also bigger than that parenthesis and then that parenthesis. No, nothing has happened. I just copied it. Okay? Yes? Zero is also a vertex of the uh, half minus one, right? Pardon me? And so here in the second line, and the last line, you might have to check when u is zero, because a i j could be... Oh, no, no, no. These are, these are okay. By this I mean oh, vectors that whose sum is equal to one. It's a probability simplex. So this is the set of all vectors, right. non-negative integers of length alpha, whose sum is equal to one. And the vertices, it's an, an alpha minus one dimensional polytope with vertices one zero zero zero, zero one zero zero zero, blah blah blah, zero 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 one. Okay? And so this is the condition, right? This expression over here is greater or equal to that, and that, and that. Okay? Almost done. Okay? Now, watch this. So this A. Whatever it is, it's in the simplex, right? So I claim this is equivalent to to the following thing. And I'm going to call this star AI times alpha minus the sum over all JK AIJK BJCK is equal to zero for all i. Okay, so now that's the moment when I usually confuse myself. So let's see why that's true. Okay. So how can that be? Okay. So I have a convex combination. I have a convex combination of numbers of quantities. So I have a convex combination of you know kimchi and yuke jang and I, I have a bibimbap, I have a convex combination of a bunch of different things. Okay? And that convex combination is greater or equal to each of these things. Right? How can that be? Well, either a multiplier, like the multiplier for bibimbap is zero, or the they're equal. Right? Either, you know, a multiplier is zero. Either alpha ai is zero, but if ai is not zero, uh, and that shouldn't be a, that should probably be, I'm sorry, that should be u. Now I'm in. Okay, so it's better. Now it's better, right? So I have a convex combination, right? So if somebody occurs at all, then he has to be you. 
Right? So Reiner gets it. This is a, this is a little tricky, okay? It's, it's not difficult, but it's tricky, right? So I have a convex combination of a bunch of things, each greater or equal to everything, right? Well, either the multipliers in the convex combination, they're those that are zero and those that are non-zero. Let's focus on the ones that are positive, right? Then the only way this can be is if they're all equal and they're all equal to you, okay? Good, that was the hard part. Now it gets easy again, okay? That, that was the hard part. So now I've translated everything into a system of polynomial equations. So now we're almost home, okay? So doing great in time. <coughs> That's the system, okay? So we need to solve this system, okay? That's the system we want to solve. So here's the big theorem. Big theorem. Big theorem. This was proved by Nash, who got the Nobel Prize in economics for showing that this always has a solution. The so star always has a solution. There's always, no matter what the payoff tables are, for any choice of payoff tables, for any triple of tensors, capital A, capital B, capital C, any choice, there is at least one Nash equilibrium. One point A, B, C in the compact polytope delta that will satisfy all of these things. And then, you know, since this was an F and only F, and this was an F and only F, and this was an F and only F, that's, you know, saying there's a Nash equilibrium. So every game in normal form has at least one Nash equilibrium. Okay. So that's the thing. Now, how is this proved? Okay, how do you prove such a theorem? This is proved using topology. So Nash proved this using Brouwer's fixed point theorem. There are different versions, but basically this is proved using fixed point theorems and topology. So you say, you know, you have a compact ball, you know, and you set it up as a fixed point map, and then under some hypotheses there is a fixed point. Okay, so all proofs somehow are topological. Okay. Now we being so excited about next year's SIEM meeting in Applied Algebraic Geometry, we would like to use our knowledge of algebraic geometry and sparse systems and Bertini and so on to deal with this, not using topology. So here's what I propose. Okay. Let's focus in our discussion on the interior, on totally mixed Nash equilibrium. Let's discuss totally mixed Nash equilibrium. So this I mean solutions, if any, in the interior. In the interior of our decision polytope delta. Okay. Now, why is this legitimate? So this is legitimate from the point of view of algebraic geometry. Okay? So what I like to do is I like to separate the complexity of this problem into two parts. There's a combinatorial complexity, and the combinatorial complexity has to do with the fact that delta has many, many faces, exponentially many faces. Delta has many faces, and Nash doesn't tell us where the Nash equilibrium is. It's going to be on some face. Okay? That's the combinatorial complexity. And then there's the algebraic complexity of solving a polynomial system and, you know, finding on that face, in the relative interior of that face, the solution. Now, on the faces, this is the same problem, inductively, right? So what am I saying? Suppose, you know, Carl knows ahead of time that Cindy is not a candidate, you know, or maybe, you know, Adam certainly not going to buy, you know, Starbucks stocks because we all hate Starbucks or something like that, then we might as well look, go to a smaller game. Uh, so we might as well assume that in the, in the mixed strategy that we choose, every option has a positive weight. That's what we're saying. Okay? So I'm going to focus on that. 
And the reason is we want to separate, so speaking sort of CS language, we want to separate combinatorial complexity with, from algebraic complexity. Okay. Um, most people in the literature focus only on the combinatorial complexity. If you'd open a book on game theory, 99% of the examples on the textbook are about two-player games. If you have a two-person game, well then you have, you know, we'll see in a moment, then the problem is a linear problem. Then on each face you just solve a linear equation. Basically it's equivalent to linear programming. Okay? So linear programming the combinatorial complexity is difficult, right? And undis we don't quite know yet exactly what to do you know, about strongly polynomial, you know, things. So there's a difficulty of finding the right vertex in, in linear programming. That's a combinatorial problem. Algebraically, it's a trivial problem because you need to solve a linear system of equations, right? Once you know where you are, once you've solved the combinatorial problem, that's why algebraically, two-person games are trivial there's still an issue of combinatorial complexity that's interesting but algebraically two-person games are uninteresting because they mean solving linear equations and in this course we're studying nonlinear equations that's the title of the course okay and that's why we focus on three-player games okay so now that we agreed on this we're almost done right so now we factor out AI, right, so now AI is strictly positive, we assumed it's strictly positive, so we might as well set this bracket to zero, right, and eliminating U, what do we get? So we eliminate U in the system star, gives us a polynomial system of alpha minus one bilinear equations in B and C. Right. Right. All we have now is we have this system, the alpha equations, but all the equations are something is equal to U, something else is equal to U, something else else is equal to U, so let's get rid of U. Right? What we're saying is something equals something else, something equals something else else, right? So we just set these things equal. This gives us alpha minus one equations that are bilinear in B and C. That's for Adam, Bob contributes beta mi beta minus one bilinear equations in A and C and then Carl has gamma one minus one bilinear equations in A and B. Okay, that's the system now we're gonna solve. Okay, so we're interested in solutions to this system. Solutions in positive quantities A, B, and C. Okay? And the converse holds true. Any such system, any such system with real coefficients, that's very easy to see represents a three-person game. A three-player game. That's in the notes. That's corollary 6.7. Right, so we've derived, we've seen now that the hunt for totally mixed Nash equilibria is equivalent to solving a system of polynomial equations, right? The number of equations, it's a, a square system, the number, total number of equations is alpha plus beta plus gamma minus three equations in the same number of unknowns, effective unknowns, the dimension of the polytope, that's the dimension of delta, So we have a, a square system of this many equations and that many unknowns. Then we have to look for positive real solutions. Poo. So the applied problem is to search for positive real solutions. What are we going to do about it? Okay. 
but we do what we always do. We make the problem easier in three steps. We first disregard the inequalities, okay? Forget about positive. That makes the problem easier. Then we replace the real numbers by the complex numbers. That makes the problem a lot easier. Then we replace affine space by projective space, complex projective space, and now the problem is so easy that even algebraic geometers might be able to make a contribution. Okay, so, so we look at our equations in product of projective spaces, P alpha minus one times P beta minus one times P gamma minus one, okay? Now here's the question. How many solutions now that we're in complex land? Now we can ask questions. Now what is the expected number of solutions? That's one question we could ask. Uh, what are the Newton polytopes? Right. Now we know. I mean it's a system with a particular sparse structure, so what are the Newton polytopes that might help us in addressing that? And of course the number of solutions we're going to count is over C. Now we're going to count the number of complex solutions and then after the fact we might discuss real positive solutions. Notice the number of real positive solutions might be zero. Right? Nash's theorem only says there exists a Nash equilibrium somewhere in delta but well, might be on the boundary. So it could be that there are no totally mixed Nash equilibrium. Okay, that's Go to 6.2, which is called a three-man poker game. Okay, that was an example in Nash's paper. Okay, if you read Nash's original paper, and I urge you to always, always read your original source, right? So. So if you read the 1951 paper by Nash, she has a section called a three-man poker game, okay? There was, sexism is legitimate, this was 1951, okay? So nowadays it would be three-person, maybe it wouldn't be poker, whatever, you know. But in any case, so he talked about three men playing poker, and Nash knew that three-player games was necessary to get algebraic complexity. Right? He was a mathematician, of course, he knew that, right? So, um, okay? And this is a very simple story. He tells a very simple story, you know, where three people are playing poker and they have a, a binary choice, you know, a play, oh, I forgot it, I don't, I don't remember the rules, so you do it or you don't, right? So everybody has a binary choice. So this leads to three bilinear equations uh, in P1 times P1 times P1, right? But they are the particular kind, right? There's one parameter, right? There's a atom has one linear bilinear equation that's bilinear in B and C and so on, right? So so we calculate the mixed volume. So what is the structure? What the structure is we're talking about the facets of a three-dimensional cube. Right? So we have a three cube. Right, this three-dimensional cube has coordinates A, B, and C, right? Adam has a bilinear equation corresponding to this two-dimensional facet. Bob has, a bi has an equation, you know, corresponding to that one. And Carl has an equation here. And those who came to the discussion session learned that there are two equations, right? The mixed volume of the three facets of a three-dimensional cube is two. Exercise four in yesterday's exercise sheet. Okay. Now, let me tell you a little bit more. So the other sections here are called equations defining 
Nash Equilibria. And there it's worked out for n players. So the same derivation that I gave here, it, it works perfectly analogously for n player games. And then, you know, 6-4 sort of deals with the combinatorics. So, title of this section is the mixed volume of a product of simplices. That's what it boils down to. Right? So we have a particular structure of uh, various mixed simplices. We have various products of simplices here and we need to calculate the mixed volume and then there's a general combinatorial formula that you can see in section 6.8. Okay. I like to uh, move a little bit uh, in this direction and then end with a statement of Dada's universality theorem. Okay, let's talk about n players because that's a nice example to illustrate that with binary choices. Okay, so we're given n payoff tables. So we have payoff tables. They are format two by two by two, two by two by two payoff tables. Now, I should say. The literature on game theory is enormous. I mean, nowadays the action is between economics and computer science. Okay, very no nobody does this in the math department. Very few people do this in the math department, but there's a lot of excitement has been, you know, between computer science and economics, quantum games, graphical games. I mean, there's a, a million papers that, that develop this and develop their complexity theory. And as always, when topics are exciting big data, whatever, whenever you have exciting topics, let the excitement subside. When the topic is out of fashion again, that's the perfect time for mathematicians to get in. That's the right time for us to really think, you know, develop methods, think deeply about the geometry and the algebra. So, and I think in game theory we're getting there. This was very excited. Very soon it's going to be out of fashion and then it's a great time to enter the field for, for a young mathematician. Okay, so we have n multilinear equations. Now, in the binary case, we have mul n multilinear equations of degree n minus 1. Total degree n minus 1. In the binary case, we're working on a product of projective lines, p1 times p1 times p1, and they define the totally mixed Nash equilibria. Okay, let's do an example. So, suppose we have a game with five players, a five-man poker game, right? So then, you know, the structure, let me indicate the structure of the equations, okay? I'm gonna, this is a cartoon. But I want you to understand this structure. So, so affinely, you know, I have, uh, I have five copies of P1 and they have affine coordinates A, B, C, D, and E. Right, they have five players and each player, so a is the probability that the first player picks the first choice. 1 minus A is the probability that that player picks the other choice. Okay? Last player, should he be vegetarian, yes or no? E is the probability that he will be vegetarian. And 1 minus C is that he will eat meat. Okay? Those are our unknowns, A up to E. Okay? So then the first player's equation has this support structure. The second player looks like this. I'm going to draw this out. Oh. 
bear with me. There's a certain point I want to make. <clears throat> Second to last player. So these bullets are some real numbers. Think about them as random numbers. So I'm writing down these products to illustrate the Newton polytopes of our five equations. We have a five-dimensional cube in the ABCD space, and we're looking at a system that's supported on the five facets. Right? Now suppose I multiply out this product. Right? Then I, this, I get 16 terms, and that's you know, supported on the BCDE B, facet, and so on. Okay? So I have this system. Now, of course, in general, and again, is this clear? So these are just random numbers. 11a plus 17. 85b minus 298. Okay? These are just placeholders for distinct random numbers. Okay? Now, of course, not every system factors like this. Right? That would be too easy. Right? System doesn't factor. But numerically, it does. In Bertini, it does. Right? We can make a homotopy that takes any system describing the totally next mixed Nash equilibria of, of five players with binary choices. And we can homotope to this system. We can just move in coefficient space to this system and the number of roots will be the same. Okay? So therefore, we do a root count. Might as well do a root count on this equation. Okay? Now how many solutions does this system have? Right? Well, it's a product. How hard can it be? Right? I mean, so for example, we could have a solution, you know, that goes like this. This bracket is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, and that is zero. Right? That will uniquely determine a choice in A. You know, this determines the C, this determines D, this determines E, determines A, and this determines B. Right? So we just have to pick one from each product. But of course we can't use the same variable twice, right? Because these things are random. So if this determines C, then that will determine a different C, right? This will tell us C is 17, and this tells us C is 28, and that's no solution, right? So therefore the number of solutions is 44. The number of derangements, right? There are 44 solutions. Just count, right? There are 44 ways, you know, of having, so there are 120 different permutations, but we want a fixed point free permutation. Right. So this is the number of derangements. So let me, uh, solutions, so these are fixed point free involutions, so derangements of the set A, B, C, D, E. So state this as a theorem. Let me state this here. Corollary, a nice theorem, corollary 6.9, the following numbers coincide. Okay, one, the maximum number of isolated, totally mixed, Nash equilibria of an n-person game with binary choices. Two, the mixed volume of n, the n distinct facets, modulo translations of the n cube. Right? We have the n facets, the n distinct facets of the n cube. We take the mixed volume, 
And then three, the number of derangements, fixed point free involutions of an inset. Okay. So number of derangement goes like this, one, two, nine, we saw nine yesterday, 44, 265, 1854, 14833, and so on. Okay, that's the number of derangement. That is in the encyclopedia okay? of sequences, the number of derangements. Now, see now what has happened? What has happened? We've come back from our simplification on complex projective space, back to positive real numbers, right? This is something the economists actually care about, right? I'm saying is we can build a game, you can build a game. You can build a game that has the right number of mixed net. You can make a game with five players that has 45 totally mixed Strictly positive Nash equilibria, right? How do you do that? Well, you choose this number to be positive and this negative. Positive. You, you arrange it, you know, so that the solutions are all between zero and one. Right? You can pick the coefficients so that all the 44 solutions are between zero and one. Then you unravel the equivalences we had 35 minutes ago, and you write down payoff matrices, capital A, B, C, D, E. These are payoff tensors five qubit systems if you wish, two by two by two by two by two tensors that have the right number of Nish equilibria, right? So once you see the right structure, then the transition back from complex projective space to positive real numbers sometimes not so difficult, okay? And then we have this. Um, <coughs> what else? Uh, derangements. In my university, unlike this university, Discrete mathematics is a required course. One semester of discrete mathematics is a required course for every math major and every applied math major. It's my proudest accomplishment ever. <laughs> Only accomplishment ever. Okay. Um, why is that important? Well, because everybody else all the time only studies calculus, right? But that's very limiting, right? For a freshman in math, it's very good to see discrete math. Think about the number E, right? When you take calculus, when you prepare for BC, you know, cal so how do you first learn about the number E? Your kids, when did they learn about Well, there's a story in Stuart textbook that tells about continuous compounding, or you know, half time of radioactive decay. There's a story like that, that leads to the number E. That's okay, you know, I mean, the thing about continuous compounding, nobody in the US you know, compounds interest. In Korea they do, but not in the US. It, so the only issue would be credit card debt. That could be interesting. The number E could be interesting for credit card debt. But here's a much better E story, right? Here's the number E, right? Take the fraction of derangements among all permutations, right? Count the number of fixed point free permutations divided by n factorial, the number of all permutations. That's 1 over e in the limit. Right? It's another way to think about the number e. It's another way for high school, okay, college freshmen to think about the number e. It's the asymptotic fraction of the number of derangements. Okay, last topic is universal. Okay, universality of Nash equilibrium. So this is a theorem that was proved by Ruchira Datta in her dissertation and published in 2003. And that's also the title in a paper in the journal Mathematics of Operations Research. And here's the theorem. Every real algebraic variety
is isomorphic to There's a little bit of fine print that you are welcome to discuss with Rainer, what it means in the category of real algebraic sets to be isomorphic, but it's pretty much what you think it is. Okay? It's isomorphic to the set of totally mixed Nash equilibria of the three-person game. We play our game. And also of an n-person game with binary choices. Okay, what are we saying? What we're saying is that the systems with this support structure, the systems that have these Newton polytopes, they look really special. It looks like they're defining very, very special algebraic varieties. But actually they're universal. They define all algebraic varieties. Okay? What I'm saying is if you give me your favorite system of polynomial equations in any number of variables, any polynomials in any number of variables with real coefficients. You pick the system. It should have real coefficients. Your system has some solution set that's going to be some semi-algebraic set, some real variety, solu real solutions of your set. Okay? Then I can, that is to say, Ruchira can. Ruchira will take your equations Okay? and build a three-player game. She's going to build payoff matrices A, B, and C. She's going to make the entries such that the set of totally mixed Nash equilibria, the solutions to star in delta, is the original set. Okay? A remarkable theorem. Now, of course, alpha, beta, gamma will be big. Right? So she's going to make huge, huge matrices. Right? She has to encode the complexity of your equations so it's going to be a fairly big alpha, beta, and gamma, but nonetheless. So, so Nash equilibrium are liberal equivalent. She can do the same with binary choices. Then the n gets big, right? So then we can. So what we're saying is sometimes you know we have these very very special looking multilinear equations, but they're actually you know universal in the sense that they represent all um, polynomial systems. So. Uh, there are similar universality theorems in the theory of convex polytopes and, and oriented matroids and other settings, but this is one that, that I like a lot. Um, maybe one more remark. <clears throat> Here's another theorem. It's just a side remark due to Nash and Tonoli. Proved by Nash and then sort of refined by Tonoli, some gaps in Nash original argument. Every compact differentiable manifold same Nash, different theorem. Every compact differentiable manifold is diffeomorphic. To some smooth, non singular, um, real algebraic variety. Okay. So there are two theorems of Nash that sort of go hand in hand, right? The left theorem of Nash. Well, related to Nash. So the left theorem of data related to Nash says that uh, games in normal form are universal in the setting of real algebraic varieties. The second theorem, the Nash Tonoli theorem, so the final proof was 1973, right. Italian geometer Tonoli, says that real algebraic varieties are universal in the context of differentiable manifold, right? So if you have any differential manifold, then they will, you can realize that up to diffeomorphism as the solution set to a polynomial equations. And then 
I like these two theorems side by side because it gives a charming corollary. So, charming corollary is every manifold can be encoded in the game. Okay. That's it. So I promised to end at 11.40. I'm going to end at 11.38. Um, you can ask many questions about this. Uh, is this an efficient algorithm? Yes, it is an efficient algorithm. And these are big representations, but this is actually a polynomial time encoding. Uh, you get complexity results of this. You know, the, Again, there are many papers, for instance, my colleague, Papa Dimitriou, and many of his students write papers about this that would never cite a math paper, of course, but this is a, a story on the math side. So anyway, once the excitement is over, please join it.